their mind. In their mind, they'll miss out on it. So if you all will, you can go ahead and turn your Bibles to Exodus, not Exodus, I keep counting it, Exodus, go to Ezra chapter two, and we'll go ahead and we'll start working in this beautiful passage here. Now, one of the things that I want us to understand is why are we going through the book of Ezra? It's because the goal is, is to teach the whole Bible. I think there's about 11 more books I haven't taught. And then as soon as they are taught, it's time to go back and go through them again. Some of them we haven't been in in years, maybe 10 years or such and such. I don't even remember the last time I taught the book of Joshua. It's important that we understand the book of Joshua because he has the same name as the Messiah has. The Messiah's name is Yahashua. Joshua's name is Yahashua. Yahashua is the one that led the people into the promised land to get the promise that that which the Most High God had already promised that he would give. And now his son is going to lead us into the promised land, the promised land to the heavenly Jerusalem, the, the Mount Zion that's in heaven, where the city of just men made perfect reside. That's in Hebrews chapter 12, 21, 22, 23. And you read that you begin to understand there are parallels there, even down to the name, which is which is absolutely fantastic for us to just know these things. The other thing is, let's talk about Ezra. Ezra, I call it the second book of Exodus, and you hear me get confused sometimes because it starts with an E. Now, if it had been called Tobit or if it had been called uh, Mark, and I said it was the second book of Exodus, I probably wouldn't get confused. But the reason that I call it the second book of Exodus is because the people of God, they had been in captivity in, in um. I don't want to say Babylon, in Egypt. And the reason they were in captivity in Egypt, number one, is that the Most High God said it. Number two, the, another king arose that did not know Yosef. We call him Joseph. And when those Egyptians got back in control, the Nubians, we're not talking about the Arab Muslims that are over there now. Please don't be confused by what you see now and think that's what was. I have books by people that are what you would call uh, Talmudist. The Talmudist made books. Okay, you don't know what Talmudists are. Talmudists are people that say that they are Jewish based upon the Talmud, not based upon your Bible. There is a difference between the Talmud and the Bible. Okay, good. Glad you glad you heard that. Uh, if I have time, I'll show you the difference. I own both. I own a Babylonian Talmud. I own a Jerusalem Talmud right here on this computer. But the Talmudists, whenever you have them teaching and you have the people that were actually there, you're going to find out there are some differences. And the differences are one of these people have been in captivity. One of these people were over there in Egypt and they actually became slaves to those people. And so when Akmos, Tutmos, the people with the last name Mos, Akmos, Tutmos, those people they actually got back in charge because they had lost control to what are called the Hiskos, H-Y-S-K-O-S. Those are Semitic people that ruled in Egypt. So therefore, when you see Joseph, Yosef come through, and he's a Semitic, of what I mean Semitic, I mean a Semite of the descendant of Noah, of the descendant of Shem, it was easy for them to assimilate. Although you could know that they still knew that they weren't the same as them and so far as their family, because this woman done that, he sent him over here to mock us. This Hebrew. Okay. Does the Bible tell you that the Bible tells us that he, God told Abraham, your seed, it's in the 15th chapter for those that like to make notes. Your seed, your descendants will be uh, strangers in the land. They're going to serve them for 400 years. They're going to evilly entreat them. But after that, I'm going to bring them out with great substance. When that takes place, you find out that they came from slavery. They spoiled the Egyptian. In other words, they routed the Egyptian. They did not come out of slavery empty-handed. Did you hear what I just said? They did not come out of slavery with an apology. They did not come out of bondage with just an apology. And there were many Egyptians that died. There was a cultural thing that took place. 
And there was a spiritual war that took place that the Most High God showed that I'm God over all the kingdoms of the earth. And I'm God over this one. I'm God over everything that lives and moves and breathes. I'm over the water and the Nile. I'm over the frogs. I'm over the flies. I'm over darkness. I'm over light. I'm over the sun. And I'm over you, Pharaoh. And he brought them out, made them willing to let them go. And when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, the blessed God who is blessed forever, amen, he brought them out, took them through. And if you read, if you read your Bible, if you know anything about your Bible, the last few chapters of the book of Exodus, I say around 30 through 40, it allows you to see that they were going to build a house for God. And they were going to build a house, not, not what we call our house, but it was going to be a house that was symbolic for the most high God to dwell in. It was going to be called the tabernacle. They had to have red, ram skin dyed red, which are called badger skin, or some books will call them porpoise skin. They had what a skeletal structure in it. They had shittim or acacia wood. They had silver bases for them to sit on, just like it was a foot. They had gold capitals on it and it had furnishings in there that had, were made with gold covered over the wood some things were just gold they had some things brass they had a place to wash they had a light that was in there they had a table of shoe bread but all of that was most most beautiful but inside there was a three-story building street three story one two three you don't see it written like that in the bible you see three levels you have an outer court then you have a holy place then you're the holiest of holies. How do you know it's three stories, Tim? Because the holiest of holy was to represent the third heaven where the most high God reside. And therefore, inside of that, you had cherubim that would face each other. And over and under the cherubim was a mercy seat, a gold plate. It was a seat of mercy. But that mercy seat also was a seat of judgment. Once a year, the high priest would come in there and sprinkle blood on it seven times that would show that God had dealt with the sins of the nation. In that holy of holy place, that was where God's replica of his throne was. It was called his footstool, the, the house of God. But that throne, that Ark of the Covenant, it represented his throne. And it would be carried when they wrapped it up on the shoulders of the Kohathites, which is exactly the same way you see in the book of Ezekiel chapter one, when you see God come down and he's on top of the firmament and he's being carried by those cherubim with four faces. Oh, this thing is sweet. What's the point, Tim? When they got that building built and as they were building that building, God gave his people laws. You think I'm lying? Sometimes to open your Bible to Exodus chapter 24 and 5, you'll see Moses sprinkle blood on the people and he sprinkled it on the books of the covenant. And when he does that, these people have entered into a blood covenant with the most high God. And they said, all that he has said, will we do and be obedient? They didn't keep the word. I said, they didn't keep the word. So when you start reading in the book of Numbers and you start looking at Numbers, the first chapter, and you start moving, you start seeing after the first year, God has given them a law to set up government. He's given them Torah to know how to serve him. And he's teaching them how to treat him, how to treat one another. At the same time, he's already given them what we call the 10 words or the 10 commandments. And if you look in the book of Numbers, you look in the book of Leviticus, he's going to show the priesthood how they should conduct themselves to act, to be able to set up this government. He did all that in the first commandment. He gave them more than some churches will ever give their people in 30 or 40 years he gave that to them within the second year what are we waiting on tim you're talking over my head it's only over your head because you decided most of the time that you didn't want to learn this and i talk to people sometimes they're doctors sometimes they're lawyers why is this over their head because it wasn't important i talked to people that know just about every song that come on the radio in the 80s why is this over your head because you didn't care well the time has come to care most of us don't have as long to live as we have already lived. And most of us have not given the most high God any kind of appreciable gratitude for what he has done for us in so far as being loyal to him and obeying him. Now, 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 what are we saying? In the book of Ezra, these people have gone into captivity. The most high God has gone in again 
and delivered his people when they couldn't deliver themselves. He has turned the hearts of kings to make them do them good. Well, if you say, Tim, he didn't turn the heart of Pharaoh, I, I was going to say, what you been reading, man? Did you not see Pharaoh's heart get hard? Then it would get, then he would relent. Then it would get hard again. It would relent. Then God would harden it. And then God would let him back off and God would harden it till he destroyed him. Do you not understand that when you're in captivity and you're walking with God or you have walked with God, there are some provisions for you to make it back if you'll do it like he says. Ezra is talking about that. Now, when we went through a few weeks ago, oh, probably before we, must have been about three months ago. I'm sorry, it was back in October. Those that will go to our Facebook page where it's called STM, that's for Seeking Truth Ministry, chapter and verse classes, STM, chapter and verse classes. I'm going to reload that so it'll kind of fit where I'm going with chapter two. So what are we talking about here? Well, in Ezra, they were supposed to build the Most High God a house when they got there. They were supposed to build a house. They were going to build an altar so that they could get the government in line. And then when we go through, we got two more books after this to go through. We got Esther, which is going during the Persian period. And we're going to talk about Esther. We need to talk about that. As we go through Esther, we got to go through Nehemiah. And when we go through Nehemiah, we're going to see how God is the one that sets up protection. God is the one that set up judgment. And all of these things, we're going to see that Yahweh God makes kings work in the behalf of his people when in no other way is it advantageous for them to do that. Now, some might think that it would be, but if you really knew who Yahweh was, it's not really advantageous for you insofar as to continue to oppress his people to let them have their own way. So in Ezra, these people are coming back. And that's why if you were with us, we taught the book of Haggai, because in the book of Haggai, they went back under the decree of Cyrus to do these things, and they built their own place. They hooked themselves up. It's for instance, like people with COVID now, they've had all this time, we can't work, we don't have a shot, we can't go places, they closed down, they making us wear masks, and you've caught up on everything on Netflix that you wanted to, everything on Amazon that you wanted to, and you went and found and invented new things to watch. You caught up on the old sports, you caught up on all the gossip, you caught up on all the memes, but did you catch up on the book of Ezra? Did you catch up on the book of Nehemiah? Did you catch up on who the Holy Spirit is or who God the Father is? Why is he called God instead of El? Why is his name sometimes called El Elyon? Did you catch up on who the Messiah is? Did you catch up on how great Melchizedek was as opposed to Moses and Levi? So much so that they had already paid tithes in Abraham. If you didn't catch up on what's important, what's to stop you from going back and being mediocre when you go back to those buildings again what but there are some people that have taken advantage of this and they'll probably never be the same let's share this screen and let's go into our text you see one of the things that happened is on the sabbath we taught this in a different way and it messed up hurt my feeling i had a different kind of microphone in and I was just talking, I was just like this on the Facebook. And I, I couldn't hear me. And I said, we can go and match up the so-and-so. And so I said, no, you can teach it again. It's so, it's so multidimensional. You don't have to teach it the exact same way. So let's go and let's look at what we got. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Thank the Lord bless his everlasting name that sits between the cherubim. You should be able to see my screen on my left panel. We're going to work with this verse. This verse. Why is that? Look with me as I scroll. You see all these names? Look at all these names. Look at these names. Look at these names. Ooh -wee. So I want to be able to, when we go through and I give you these names, it's going to mean something about these names. It's going to mean something about the order of the Most High God. It's going to mean something. No, he knows your name. It's going to mean something. He's got these people inscripturated, inscripturated 
so that we can see their names forever. But you also got a history that you can go back to when people tell you that these people are tell Moodus and you are nothing or tell you that you're a Gentile and you can look back and say, wait a minute. Okay, whoever is telling me that I'm a Gentile, can they go back and show me in any of the documentation of the cities, the towns, the states, the provinces, the, the language, that these people that's telling me that I'm a Gentile, that they even lived in the area where the Bible was written. I'm just saying, just, let, let's just at least let the Bible speak for itself. It's such a beautiful, magnificent compilation of books. Notice I didn't say book. But what you have normally is 66. They don't count any of the pseudepigrapha. Now, I don't know why they don't call Job a pseudepigraphic book or Joshua because most people don't believe Job wrote Job. Another issue. You want to talk to me about it later? You can. But let's go back to our verse. This is a beautiful verse because we want to know what's going on, why it's going on, and where. And that, isn't that good questions? What, where, and why? Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, it's a continuation of the last chapter. These are the children of the province. The province, if you don't know biblical history, you read this and you just go on. These are the children of the province and you may think they're a little bit of children. These are grown men. These are families. These are some men that's gonna to have to get rid of their wives. So when you say the children of the province, what we are talking about, we're talking about the offspring and the descendants of Abraham. So you see the word here when I click on it down here, that's, you see that word Ben? That means sons, okay? These are the sons of the province that went up out of captivity, of those who had been carried away, those that have been carried away. This is important. When people tell you it don't matter who you are in the Bible, when people tell you it don't matter, everybody is the same. Well, at least if you don't grant me anything else, at least grant the scripture enough to speak for itself. It says these are particular people. It didn't say the whole world. It did not say the Hamites. It did not say the Jephthites. It did not say the Cushites. It says these are the sons of the province that went up out of captivity of those who had been carried away whom Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon had carried away to Babylon. Look, if you've ever heard of Nimrod or know anything about Nimrod, this is the area that we are talking about. That's what they call Babylon. Baghdad is over there. Iraq is over there in that, in that region. He carried them away to Babylon. And then came again to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his city. Okay, what cities are we talking about? There was a province, a Parthia of the Persians. We had talked about Babylon, and then we are talking about Jerusalem, and we are talking about Judah, which is in Jerusalem. Okay, okay. How does this work? What's going on here? I would submit to you that the children of the province never were supposed to have been in that situation to start with. So let's look and see what's going on. Why are the children of Israel having to come and make another exodus again? It looks like one should have been enough. It's like you should have seen enough in that first one that from then on, your mind should have, your heart should have been fixed. Your mind should have been made up to do it just like the most high God said. But no, most of the time, People don't do what he says. Most of the time they do something else. So look at me. Let's go with me so we can understand Ezra and see what's going on. These are the children. Deut I mean, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. Walk with me now in your mind. Now, the, now hearken, O Israel. This is Israel I'm talking about primarily. I'm about to prove that the children right here that's in, on the right panel that came up, that came to Jerusalem, Everyone to his city, which was Judah in Jerusalem. These are the same one that King Nebuchadnezzar carried away to Babylon. That's what I'm getting ready to show you. But I'm getting ready to show you how did this happen? Because if you don't understand the how, sometimes you'll miss some stuff in the Bible and you'll be told like I was told today by a young man, it doesn't really matter how you live. You can sin or whatever and still be saved because when Jesus died, he took care of your sins, past, present, and future. 
that you can sin in your body, but your eternal destiny and your soul is taken care of. I'm submitting to you that these people had already been in bondage the first time. They had been delivered or saved from bondage. When they were delivered and saved to, from bondage, when they came out of Egypt, they were not saved out of bondage to do what they wanted to do. They were actually being saved so that they could serve the Most High and be his servant and go and do what I'm getting ready to read to you now. But I'm getting ready to tell you that these people that are being brought out of captivity, many of them are not going to realize that they are not being saved. They are not being delivered to go do their own thing. They are being bought with the price. They are being, being given to God for a purpose. Those that love Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, I wasn't even going to say it, but you know what? Sometimes the Lord will bless you to have things you can remember. And when you're preaching or teaching, they say, talk about it. They love Ephesians. They say, Tim, this this dispensation, you don't understand the Bible. Uh, this man told me today there were two dispensations. Well, it's really, some people say there were seven. And if you read Lewis Berry Shaper or J.N. Darby, you're going to get way more than two. But anyway, look at what the scriptures say in Ephesians 2 and 8. Four, which is going to let you know it went back with something else. But I'm going to just start here. For by grace are you saved through faith. Through. In other words, your faith, when you're saved through faith, you're still going through the faithful process. Through faith, that don't mean that, that you can have faith one time and now you're good, okay? Let, let Tim show you. When I click on this, you see what that is? That's a verb, passive, participle. In other words, that is the thing that was saving you, the faith. But guess what? When you are saved by faith, it's not that you are saved by faith and you just do it one time. It's a continual. Read, Tim. It says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Some people like to get hung up and say, it's a gift. Is that all that he says? Let, let him finish. Not of works. What kind of works? We could talk about the works, but I think we can get to the fact that he's not saying there's no works when I finish reading. Lest any man should boast. For we are his what? Workmanship. We are his workmanship. We have been created, look, in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Which God had before, before. What do you want to look at the verb? You want to look at the verb? It's a verb, error is active. He did it sometime in the past. It's supposed to continue actively into the future. God has before ordained that we should walk in them, okay? Do you understand what should mean? Should means it's obligatory. So when you're saved by grace, you're saved like the people of Egypt were saved. That was God's magnificent gift to them, but they still had to put the blood on the doorpost. They still had to kill the lamb, etc. They had to do what they were supposed to. It was not that they went and kicked and, and beat and stomped all the Egyptians on their own. It was God's gift, but it was not of their works because when God tells you to do something, you're being obedient. Then it says, let's see the ship boast. Then he says, we are his workmanship. They were his workmanship. They were created in Christ Jesus or Messiah or somebody say Messiah wasn't living then. Please don't. Don't go there because Abraham, before the law was ever given, he had already, Christ, the Messiah, had already eaten a meal whenever Abraham prepared it for him in Genesis chapter 18. Read your Bible. He came down and he came down with two angels and Abraham had his wife and they prepared a meal for the three men. I don't know if Abraham ate or not, but they prepared the meal. So he had already met Abraham. And so it says they are his workmanship in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now that's New Testament. For those that like New Testament, for those that don't like the fact that I'm trying to show you that this is what we're supposed to do. This is how we're supposed to live. I'm going to go into Exodus chapter 24 and I'm going to go to verse 11 so that I can help us to understand that these things that I'm talking about, they are not new. They are not new. Just sometimes you, we haven't been taught as we ought to have been taught. And what we need to do is take some time, all this time you had what they call a pandemic. Some people are pandemic, pandemic, and never even heard of the word before. And all of a sudden now you get to be an expert on pandemic. 
So let me see Exodus 24. I don't want Exodus 24 yet, uh, right here. Let's go. I don't like it when I don't go where I want to go first. Let's go, I think 20, we're going to go 19 first. 19 is definitely where I want to go first because he made a covenant with them. 20, 19 and three. Moses went up to God and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain and says, thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, which is Israel, tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. I did it. And how I bear you on eagle's wings. I brought you, I redeemed you and brought you to myself. Now, if therefore you will obey my voice indeed, notice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid, they laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded and all the people answered together. I want you to see this. All the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken will we do. Not just believe, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people to the Lord, okay? Let's go back to where I was talking about, 24. Moses got to come back down. Let's try 24 and 3. Moses came. Is anything you left? No, you're good. And Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh and all the judgments. And all the people agreed with one voice and said, all which Yahweh have said will we do. And Moses wrote all of the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel. They offered burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings and oxen to the Yahweh. And he took half of the blood and put it in basins or bowls and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Notice this is blood. When you hear people pleading the blood of Jesus, and you don't understand that that's not anything new by being him it's new that way but blood covenant you most people plead the blood of jesus they don't realize they're putting a curse on themselves okay you're putting a curse on yourself you're pleading the blood of jesus and you're going against the covenant look at it look at it verse six and moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar it says, and he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, all that Yahweh have said, will we do and be obedient. If you miss this, and if you miss it in your life entirely, I believe you'll be damned. I don't care how long you go to your church. He took the book of the covenant, covenant with God, and he read it. They knew what was in it. And they said, all that Yahweh have said will we do and be obedient. We are saved to do work. They were being saved to do work. They had been brought out of the land of Egypt and now he was, he was instructing them how to live. In this book of Ezra, they're going to be instructed again how they are to live. That's your parallel. When you get to what we call the New Testament, you're going to find out it's going to be a blood covenant and it's going to be the exact same thing that you see here. And if you miss it, don't blame me. The next verse says, and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Do you understand? They're saying that you're willing to die if you don't do it. And he sprinkled it on the people. Behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh have made with you concerning all these words. Abraham made a blood covenant with the Most High God in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham was asleep. The lamp in the furnace went through substitutionary. You have God going through and you have the substitutionary part going through for Abram. He's made a blood covenant with them. Now, these are the children of Israel. What's the big deal, Tim? You told me what, who they are and why all of this. And I'm still not where you want me to be. So I'm flicking back to Deuteronomy 4. Listen to what these people are supposed to do. Now, notice when I read you that in Exodus, 
That's about 40 years, maybe yeah, about 40, 41 years before this chapter is written. All of those people that said what the Lord will do, we will be, we'll do and be obedient were dead, except Joshua and Caleb and Moses that I can remember at this time. 605,000 people that were saved, 605,000 people that were holy and a peculiar treasure to the Lord, 605,000 people that were holy set apart. And according to uh, Exodus chapter 4 and 22, the Bible said, Israel was my son and my, first, my firstborn. What they did, they moved outside of, of a blood covenant and God executed his judgment, okay? You better learn him. So in Deuteronomy, this is their children that Moses is teaching after they've gone through this horrible, horrific uh, thing that went on in their life, but it was beautiful insofar as God was upholding this holy and righteous will. So Moses is telling them, you need to fulfill that which your parents didn't do. What were they supposed to do and be obedient? Listen to Moses. Now, therefore, hearken, O Israel, to the statutes and judgment which I teach you for to do them. Now, I can hear somebody say that was under the Old Testament and that you're supposed to do what God say. But under the New Testament, we ain't got nothing to do. And I say, you just telling a God damnable lie. Just in case you think that Tim just like to say God damnable, and I do like to say it because so many things are God damnable. And I feel that people should know what God and damnable is. I flicked over here on the right hand panel to Titus 2 and 11. Listen, for the grace of God, that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, just like it did to the people in Exodus, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You hear people like, oh, it's the last day, it's the last day, we're gonna get caught up in the rapture. In the rapture. But he wasn't through talking in Titus. Listen to what else Paul told him who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, like he redeemed the people from Egypt, like he redeemed the people from Persia, the province, he redeemed from all iniquity and to purify to himself a peculiar people. What? The same thing he said back in Exodus. That he might purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous, enthusiastic, of good works. Timothy, I mean, Titus, these things speak and exhort. In other words, you make the people know this and you go along with them to do it and rebuke. Rebuke when they not do it. See it? Look at it. I click on that word that you can see. Sternly admonish with all authority. Let no man despise you. All right. Verse two back over here in Deuteronomy 4. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. Don't, I mean, you don't even take away from it. You don't add, you don't take away. That you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what you have seen, what Yahweh did because of Baal Peor. You got up in there and got with those black women. You got with those Midianite women whenever um, Balaam would, told, couldn't curse you for Balak. And he told you all to go let, let those women come in and seduce the men. And the men were seduced. You start having sex with them, start doing idolatry. And God killed a lot of his holy and saved people. Read your Bible, Numbers chapter 23 through 27. Numbers chapter 23 through 27 and see it. As a matter of fact, you don't want to do that. You go back, go backwards on the Facebook or go to our uh, YouTube page, STM, chapter and verse classes. We did the book of Numbers, every verse in it. It says, for all those men that followed by all pure, Yahweh thy God has destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave to Yahweh your God are alive, Every one of you this day. This is why I plead to the Lord when people tell me it don't matter how I live. Moses says, listen really carefully. I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as Yahweh my God commanded me, that you should, you're obligated to do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. You've already said, your parents said all that the Lord have said, will we do and be obedient? Verse six. Keep, therefore, and do, not just believe, not just memorize, not just tell somebody else to do. Tell them where you get that from, because that's what people relegated God to when you start looking. Look in the right panel. Matthew 23 and 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, 
the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat to command the people to tell them what to do. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But, what does he say after the but? Do not after their works, for they say and do not. Let's go back to the left panel. Deuteronomy 4 and 6. Keep and do them. Don't just talk about them. Don't just put them on other people when you won't do them. For this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nation, in the sight of the nation, in the sight of all of the people, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this is a great nation, or this is Hagoi. They will say of you, you are the great, you are a great nation that is wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so nigh unto them? as Yahweh our God is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget these things which your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, but teach them thy sons and thy son's sons, teach them. Notice, you got a heritage to give to your children. But this sixth verse is where those people fail. This is where we fail. Keep therefore and do them. This is your wisdom in doing them. This is your wisdom in doing them. This is your understanding in doing them inside of the nation that will hear these statutes and say, surely this is a great and a, a wise and understanding people. What nation is there so great that has God nigh unto them as the Lord our God in all things we call upon him? And what nation is so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day. You can go to China sometime and get abused. You can go to Singapore, get abused. You can go to Africa. You can go to any place. If they're not following the most high God, I don't care if they share my skin color. I don't care who they are. I don't care if it would have been in Israel. I don't care if it's Australia. I don't care if it's in Bangladesh, Spain. I don't care if it's in Europe. If they don't follow God's righteousness, you better understand and there will be no justice and there will be no peace. Yahweh was teaching them how to administer justice in the world so that they could rule. But because these people had messed up so badly, we see them having to be brought back out of the province of Persia, out of the captivity, okay? Walk with me now. We've talked about, and I'm telling you what God had for Israel. But now that I want you to see, wanted you to see what God has for Israel, I want you to see how did they lose what they had. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. Listen. I stopped reading after he talked about the wisdom because I didn't want to read all of that chapter and then some more chapters. So, but I want you to see in verse 29 of chapter 4, Deuteronomy. But if from this, you better take one verse before this. 20, let's take 20, 27, 26. Yeah, take 26 because God is God is going to bring them to court. He said, I'm going to bring you to court if you don't do what I said. You've been created under good works. You've said all that I do. Say it will you do and be obedient. I'm going to show you the reason for the captivity and the reason that they had to be let go in the second exodus. Yahweh God says in the 26th verse, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land where you go over Jordan to possess it. You shall not pro prolong your days, but you shall utterly be destroyed. This is if they turn from him, 27. And Yahweh will scatter you among the nations. I, I wanna make this plain. Show me any other nation that have been scattered among all the nations. Do, do you know any other nations? You see, cause if they're gonna be scattered among the nations, then they would have to also be scattered among here in America too, right? I mean, can we say that? What about in Australia, okay? What about in Russia, okay? What about Italy? What about Spain? What about Africa? Is it so people right now that are Talmudists, 
When have they ever been scattered over here to be slaves? Well, let's keep reading. And Yahweh shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there you shall serve gods, the works of men's hands, wood, stone, which neither see, nor, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if from thence, listen, listen, we're talking about the second exodus. But if from this you shall seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him if thou seek him with all thy heart and soul. When the Bible says that Moses met the most high son in the bush, he said, I've heard their, cra their cries. I've seen their tears. I come down to see about it. If when you're scattered in captivity and oppression, if you seek the Lord your God, you'll find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. He says, when thou art in tribulation and all these things come upon you, look, if you don't read Deuteronomy chapter 28, 15 through 32, you won't even understand all of this. But people have a limited time span in their mind. It says, when all these things come upon you in the latter days, if you turn, notice, even in his judgment, he has something for you. If you turn to the Lord your God and shall be what? Obedient to his voice. For, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. But notice the mercy doesn't come before the obedience. Notice. If you turn and be obedient, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy ye thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which ye swear unto them. So we get a little taste, but what would the captivity be like in Persia? What would the captivity be like under Roman domination? What would the captivity be like in America or in other places in the world? Because if you think that this thing was for them and it's over with, then you need to get rid of most of your Bible because every promise pretty much in the New Testament is predicated upon something that was written in the Hebrew scriptures, okay? Even down to Messiah, even talking about a new heaven and a new earth. Read Isaiah 66 sometime. All right. So in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 25, it says, Yahweh shall cause you to be smitten before your enemies. This is what happened during the days of Jeremiah and the days of Ezekiel. Gary is teaching on Thursday nights, the book of Jeremiah, and he's showing where they turned against the Most High God, and God was taking them into captivity. And this is why we had that Nebuchadnezzar when I read the four names. Nebuchadnezzar is going to fulfill that. So it says, and the Lord shall cause you to be smitten before your enemies, and thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven before them. Thou shalt be removed, listen, and thou shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Can you show me one group of people that have been removed to all the kingdoms of the earth? Can you tell me that Theodore Herzl, that his people moved to all the kingdoms of the earth when Hitler did what he did? And that was actually German against German. Can you tell me? Can you tell me it was Arnold Murray and his group? They said they're British Israelites. Can you tell me it was Herbert W. Armstrong and his group? They were called British Israelites. And you can go to Christagena, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-G-N-E-N-A.com, -N -N -E and they'll say they're British Israelites. Can you show me where they were taken and smitten all over the earth or just the European wars that they had with each other? I'm just talking about historically now. If you believe the Bible, then it should be to stand scrutiny. Amen, amen, and amen. It says, you should go out one way and flee seven, 20, let's see, and you'll be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, and thy carcass shall be meat to the fowls of the air and the beast of the earth. Do you know what that means? You'll be dung. Tim, you, you be in growth. When an animal eats meat or eats some flesh, what happens because of their short elementary canal? It becomes dung on the ground, okay? As a matter of fact, I've been walking sometime and I've had some bird dung hit me in the head and I was so angry at that bird. And he was up there, you can't get me up <laughs> anyway. And the carcass shall be meat to the fowls of the air and the beasts of the earth and no man shall fray them away. This is what the Most High God is saying. The Lord will smite you with madness and with blindness and astonishment of heart. Listen, and thou shalt grope at noondays as a blind grope for darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt only be oppressed. I shall only be oppressed 
and spoiled evermore. Have you ever known of people that can work for 400 years and never, never get the retribution for what they've done? I mean, they got their retribution when they came out of Egypt. They got retribution when they came out of Persia. When we go through it, you're going to see Cyrus send stuff, and you're going to see under Nehemiah, you're going to see the king send some. I'm just saying, retribution? No. No, I'm just talking about when you look and you see what the Bible says, you shall only be oppressed. In other words, if I can make laws right now to make it where you are legally in, in every way still discriminated against, I can make it legally in every way with my laws to put you under what they did during the time of convict leasing when they made black men go and work in the coal mines without pay because you said they owed them something and you had what they call debt prison and you can go make them work on the cotton field and you can make them work in, some, in South Carolina in the rice fields and you can make them work in Barbados and different places in the Caribbean on the sugar. If you can do that and tell me that that's not oppression, if you can tell me for 75 years you can't get an education, but I can see people on the web say other people come here and in two decades they're doing ahead and they never had laws written that are still on the books that dehumanize that destroy the culture, that destroy the life, and then give them a bastardized form of Christianity where you can live any kind of way you want to and do anything that you want to to the black man over here and then say the black man is just a nigger or African when you know everybody in Africa have their own tribes and names and you can go in your history books and see what happened when the people started scattering down to Africa. The Jews were scattering down from Afri Africa when Vespasian sent his son Titus to destroy that temple in 70 AD. I'm not even talking about 722 BC. I'm not talking about 605. I'm not talking about 597 or 596 on 586 on Nebuchadnezzar. I'm just talking about that which we really should be able to look at. Well, notice what he says. Thou shalt betroth the wife and another man shall lie with her. You can see that kind of stuff in the book by Douglas Black. I think it's Blackman, B-L-A-C-K-M-A-N. He has a video on YouTube. Watch the full one. Slavery by a different name. You can, you can see that throughout the, our history. You shall betroth a wife. Sometimes you can marry and another man lie with her. You shall build a house and not dwell therein. You shall plant a vineyard and not gather the grapes thereof. I don't want you to think that everything that I'm saying right here is primarily dealing with our situation in America. This happened in the book of Judges. Don't act like I don't know what I'm talking about. Listen to what the Bible says in verse number 31. But well, let, let's kind of skip because all this is really good, but I need you to understand we're moving so that you can see why Ezra, I'm calling it the second Exodus and trying to make ec the book of Ezra as exciting to you as it is to me. It says, the Lord shall bring thee, listen, this is important. The Lord shall bring thee in thy king, which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. Well, do we serve other gods over here? I know Israel had to do that. They had to go and they bow down. Nebuchadnezzar built the statue. And as he built the statues, everybody was supposed to bow down when the sat button, all the sorcery was supposed to play. But do we serve another god? Do we serve the Feast of Bacchus? I'm, I'm talking about, we call it Christmas, the Feast of Bacchus. Look at it. And the Lord of Misrule, Lord, L-O-R-D of Misrule. Yes, we do. We call it Christmas. What about Astarte and Easter and the bun, the fertility bunny? Well, do, do, we, do we serve those days? Because they're getting ready to be coming around again when it come about Easter. And what about what about the Day of the Dead, the Souls Day of the Dead? We, we call that Halloween. We serve those things. What about the Yule log, which is a penis? A phall it's a phallic symbol that they would burn and they would spread the ashes for first fertility. We serve those. And you say something about it, they want to choke me. You want to get mad at me because I tell you the truth. God make you my enemy because I tell you the truth. Then God be praised forevermore. It says, it said that you have not known, verse number 37, and you shall become an astonishment and a proverb and a byword among all nations where the Lord shall lead you. Let me tell you something. Who is the byword in America or in the world today? Is it the Talmudist? Are they the byword? Are they an astonishment? You own Israel. They own the TV. They own the radio. They own print. They own media. They do. Are they the byword? Or is it the one you call African American? The one you call niggas? The one you call ex-slaves? Is it the one that you call the uh, what you call the jungle rats? 
jungle bunnies, and I, I, that's what that's what somebody in politics right now called us. But do you understand? We are the bad word. Go take their land. Go take their gold in South Africa. Let's go take their diamond. Let's go take the land, says the Chinese. Let's go take what they have and appropriate it and make it ours. Who else has gone through all this in the world and we still act like we don't know the Lord? You'll carry out much seed in the field and gather but little and the locusts shall consume it. They experienced that through the book of Judges and you'll see it again in the book of Joel. Let's go to verse 64. It says, and I want you to hear this. It says, and the Lord, Yahweh shall scatter thee among all people. Who else have been scattered among all people? I just, just look. Everywhere you look, just by you gonna find one of, <laughs> and the Lord shall scatter you among all people from one end of the earth even to another and there you shall serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even of wood and of stone do you think it ever took place what was going to be the remedy if we look in back here because I don't want you to ever forget where we are we in Ezra we in Ezra 2 Let's make sure we get where we are. It says, now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity that should have never went into the captivity because they supposed to be leading the world. They supposed to have the wisdom. They're supposed to have the knowledge, but because they turned away from God, God has sent them out to other nations like he said that he would. So what were they supposed to do in order to get free? Were they supposed to raise a big military? Were they supposed to get a, a, a weapon? Were they supposed to have biological weapons? Were they to have tanks? No. Listen to what the Most High God said through his beautiful man, Solomon. Solomon is praying to God when God has already appeared, when God has appeared to him and he's getting ready to bless the temple that he built. Listen to what the Bible says here. It says, yet if they bethink themselves, what are we talking about? Better get 46. It says, if they sin against thee, this is the children of Israel, but there is not a man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them and deliver them to the enemy so that they carry them away captive into the land of their enemies far or near they are going to all the nations of the earth. Yet if they bethink themselves in that land, whether they be carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, we have sinned, we have done perversely, we have committed wickedly. It says, and return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the, in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive and pray toward their land, which you gave their fathers, the cities which you have chosen and the house which I have built for your name. Then hear their prayer and their supplication from heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee and all their transgressions where they have transgressed against thee and give them compassion before them who carried them captive that they may have compassion on them. This is what you see taking place right here in Ezra. They sent them away and they didn't send them away empty handed. There's something else to be said about that in Second Chronicles 7 and 20. Listen to what the Most High God say. In the 19th verse, I want you to look, okay? And I'll read 17 and 20, I mean 19 and 20. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes that all of the nations are supposed to know, that all the, because you're supposed to, all that I say, do and be obedient. You're supposed to be able to show the wisdom to the nation. But if you turn away and forsake my statutes, my commandments, which I said before you, and go out and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up by the roots out of my land. This is why when people say nobody can pluck you out of the Father's hand, they, they, <laughs> It's not anybody doing that. Yahweh is claiming to be the one to do it. Then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them and this house, which I have sanctified for my name. I or will I cast them out of my sight and I will make it to be a proverb and a byword among the nations. That's what he said. Now, how do you know that this has happened? And how do you know that this is why these people are the same people that's coming back and you're saying that they are not totally free and that they still got a captivity in their mind? Let me show you, okay? Let's get to the juice. 
Deuteronomy chapter 28, I told you 28, 15 through 32 will tell you the curses, but I want you to see one major curse that came on them. And from there, we should be almost finished with it. We, when I finish showing you this section, this kind of section about what's going to happen, we'll almost be finished for the night. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47, Yahweh says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things. Therefore, and this is gonna be good, so let's get it. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. Can you tell me any other group in the world that have had to do this all over the world? There you shall serve your enemies. I'm talking about whether they're African enemies or whether they're Iranian. Or, I mean, they still sell us in Muslim countries. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies, which the Lord shall send against you in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and want of all things. He shall put a yoke upon a yoke of iron on your neck. Can you ever been to the slave museum in America? There's one in Atlanta. They got some shackles of the metal that they put around your neck. They got one in Alabama I want to go see. And they did this to the church and the visual. You can see them being marched in the release where uh, you can see different things in some of my old books and on the web. Can you tell me that there's any other nation that you've seen all over the earth carried around in shackles of iron naked? Well, if you can, please bring the information to me and let me and let me see their history and their origin. And I guarantee you it won't be these people. It says, you shall serve your enemies, the Lord shall send you against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and one of all things. You shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck till he have destroyed you. Listen to this one. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, far from the end of the earth as swift as an eagle. Well, in the book of the New Testament or the book for the New Testament, they actually had a nation that actually was over them and their ensign was an eagle and that eagle was wrong. And guess what the one that we have now in America is? Oh, y'all don't want me to hear it. It don't mean for me to say it either. As swift as an eagle flies. A nation, listen, whose tongue thou shall not understand. Do you know what that means? A nation who has a tongue that's unknown to you. You don't understand it. A nation of fierce countenance. We shall not regard the person of the old, nor show a favor to the young. Okay, so... What's the big deal about that? God has said, I'm going to send you to a nation and they're going to have, they, you're not going to understand their language. Instead of you being in charge, they'll be in charge. Isaiah quotes from this. And I want you to understand before they ever go into this kind of captivity, about a hundred and something years before they go into captivity in the South, I want you to see Isaiah teaching the same thing that Moses said about a nation, you're going to have to learn another tongue. Haven't we had to learn another tongue? Don't, do, do you disagree with me? All right. It says, and another thing, you ever notice a lot of time when other people come to this country, we have to learn their, their language many times, depending on who they are. Okay, verse nine, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, those that have grown up. For precept must be upon precept precept upon precept that don't that make sense in other words order upon order and order upon order line upon line and line upon line here a little and there a little now please look at verse 11 for with stammering lips and another tongue with stammering lips and another tongue another tongue another language will he speak to this people what Will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you would cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of Yahweh was unto them, precept upon precept upon precept, line upon line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken. What he is showing here is that 
when you don't do, you're gonna be taking away captivity. And in captivity, you're gonna be under you're gonna be under somebody with another tongue, with an unknown tongue to you, and they're gonna be over you. Not only are they gonna be brutal and cruel to you, but you're gonna to have to learn their tongue, you have to learn their language and serve them because you wouldn't serve me. So let's see, did it really happen? Daniel chapter one, verse one. This is where we get in the area where Persia, when it takes over Nebuchadnezzar's place, the Medes and the Persians, we're going to have to see the people that actually were able to send the people back from the captivity after 70 years. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon to Jerusalem and besieged it. In other words, he encamped all around it. And Yahweh gave Jehoiakim of Judah into his hand. Who did? Yahweh plucked him out and put him in his hands with part of the vessels of the house of God, and he carried into the land of Shinar, Nimrod's land, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God, and he spake to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, the men that had been castrated. He spoke to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel of the king's seed. In other words, that you bring certain Hebrews in here of the king's seed and the princes, children of whom there is no blemish, but well-favored, skillful in wisdom, not dummies. You didn't go and take the people that were so stupid they could do nothing. You took the people that could build for you. You took the people that could do for you and administrate, and you put them with the captain of the units. Don't you tell me that you think you're going to put me with the captain of the units and let me still be a full male. Don't even try it. It says skillful, cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such had ability to stand in the king's palaces that they might listen, that they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldees. You are under somebody with an unknown tongue. It's a sign of a curse. It's the sign of the curse that you turn away from God. And instead of them learning your language, your culture, and learning what you want, they're trying to wipe away all your culture. They're going to wipe away your holy days. They're going to wipe away everything that Yahweh taught you about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're going to teach you about Gilgamesh. They're going to teach you about the giants. They're going to teach you about Nimrod. They're going to teach you all the magic arts that they have. And they're going to try to get you in their university and turn you away from Yahweh. Way. Notice that they might teach the learning, the learning of the tongue of the Chaldees. And the king appointed them daily provision. We're going to feed you. The king's meat got good food and the wine which he drank. So nourishing them up three years, three years, we're going to train you and get that stuff out of you that at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. We're going to meritoriously manumit you that you can be over your people to work our agenda in the same way that we saw people get meritoriously manumitted in the days of slavery from Virginia when they wrote, wrote the law of meritorious manumission. If you save the master's life, if you save the master's house, if you told when there would be a rebellion, they would allow you to be manumitted. Oh, yes, it is written. They got it written in the laws. Verse 6. Now, among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. To Daniel, he gave Belteshazzar. To Han Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael of Meshach. And to Azariah, Abed, Nego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuch that he might not defile himself. Now Yahweh, now God had brought Daniel to favor and tender love with the princes of the eunuch, and he was able to get what he wanted, and they chased him at the 10 days. They were different. I submit to you, we don't have to have the power of man to get rid of oppression. 
We need the power of God, which sometimes we have to go through. But I need you to understand this book of Ezra is important. It's the second Exodus. If you say, Tim, it's taking a long time to get there. That was a long time before you got to what was going on in the Exodus. You got to had to go through and see how they hated Joseph. You had to see it. Not only they sold Joseph, Joseph was sold again. And he was in Potiphar's house. And he had to go to jail. Then he was up with, and then he was up with the Pharaoh. And then he was able to be in charge. And his brothers had to come. And he had to feed the whole nation. Then you had to find out another king. But the Bible wanted you to know why. Yahweh was acting and you can go your whole life and never pay attention to the book of Ezra because somebody has told you it was nothing to you and I'm trying to dispel that myth in Acts chapter 2 verse 7 this was at the day of Pentecost. Notice what happened on the day of Pentecost. I'll read verse five. It said they were dwelling in Jerusalem. They were coming to the feast days. They were in Jerusalem, Jews. Devout men look out of every nation under heaven. How did they get to every nation under heaven? They were dispersed. It says, now when this was noised abroad, and I guarantee you they weren't coming from Russia and Prussia and Poland. But anyway, it says, devout nation uh, out of every nation under heaven, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and every man heard them speak in his own language. Notice these are Jews who got different languages. How is that? Notice, let's, let's get it good. If they, these people filled with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak with other tongues that the Spirit gave utterance. They were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. When this was noise abroad, the multitude came together. They were confounded because every man heard him speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, let all these that speak Galileans. And how is it every man, listen, Every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Not that this was the language of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but where we were born. And the first one they give is Parthians. These are the people that sent them back during the time of Ezra. Mede. The Medes are the people that took over with the Parthians under uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who called the Medes and the Persians. Elamites. Dwellers of Mesopotamia, these are the areas over there, Baghdad area, uh, the area where Nimrod was, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the points of Lib look, Libya, Serene, these are African places. Strangers of Rome, when we're talking about Rome, we, I'm, I'm saying strangers of Rome that was in that because they had taken over these parts that were those, what we call African and where the Hebrew people live. Jews and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, the Arabians, we got people that are Arabians that live over there in that area, uh, right there where Pakistan, not Pakistan, where Bangladesh, not, what, get your words right, Babylon is, I keep wanting to say Babylon and get my, my, my tongue confused, is that we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful words of God. Now, I want you to catch that. They heard that. So when you start looking and you see what Paul says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 20, he said, brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice, be ye children in understanding. But in, I'm saying, be ye children in malice, but in understanding be men. In the law, it is written with men of other tongues and, and lips will I speak to this, this people. That's what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49. It was, uh, 20, it was 28 and 49, I believe that was. 28 and 47, 49 and 50. Then it says, again, in Isaiah, when Isaiah quotes it, Isaiah 28 and 11 through 15, he says, I will speak to this people, yet for all this they will not hear me. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, because the, the promise of the judgment and the curse was on those that didn't believe that would be taken into captivity. I ain't making it up. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. For prophesy and serveth not for them that serveth not for them that believe not. Prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. And what was the thrust? What was it coming from? Paul was saying that the people that didn't even understand what was happening, they wanted to elevate the tongue above teaching or the prophesying of God's word. That's what he said. And this is why <clears throat> you see in 16, he says, 
He says, else when you, you bless in the spirit, how shall he that occupy the room of the unlearned, unlearned say amen at your giving of thanks, seeing he understand not what you're saying. Uh, you give thanks well, but the uh, other is not edified. I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. You spoke a lot of languages, they say. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding by my voice that I may teach. My job is to fulfill that the Hebrews are supposed to learn. They're supposed to see my wisdom. They're supposed to see my knowledge and the statutes that they could learn. That's what it was about. It wasn't about edifying. It was edifying God's assembly that I may teach others also in 10,000 unknown tongues. And that's why he said, brethren, be not children in understanding how be it in malice be children. What's your point, Tim? The point is this. When you get into your Bible and you have people to go and tell you, let me look at my time. Oh, glory. Can you be through in eight minutes? I believe you can. Yeah, I know you can. You got the powers. When you go to Romans chapter 10 and you look at Romans 10, let's look at just the first verse. To these same people that were delivered as captive from the province, these are their descendants. I've already shown you that they were Israel. But notice what Paul says about them. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they are going about to establish their own righteousness. This is why people say you can't keep the law because most of the time they're not talking about the law of God. They're talking about the law that they set up or their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God for Christ is the end or the telos the goal of the law to him that believe. So he says, Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law that the man that doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith, we're talking about you saved by grace through faith, so let's talk about it. The righteousness of faith speaketh on this wise, say, if not, who shall ascend up into heaven? Let's go to Deuteronomy, because that's what I've been showing you. I have been showing you this whole time that what God had been doing and what God had set up for his people was the fact that he was wanting them to lead and for them they have to be brought out of captivity is because of the fact they had done something to put them in captivity. So what I what I want you to do is I'm going to move over here and put this in Deuteronomy 30 so I can have both panels open at the same time so that I can move quickly as I want to. Deuteronomy 30. Come on now, open up, show me love, show me love. There we go. Moses is saying to those same people that he just gave the curse to. And we saw it fulfilled in Nebuchadnezzar. It was fulfilled under the Persians. When we get to Esther, we're going to see it fulfilled more in Esther. We're going to see it fulfilled more in Nehemiah. But I know what I'm talking about. 30 and 1, let's go quickly. And it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, you shall call them to mind where? Among all nations where the Lord your God has driven you. And you shall return to the Lord. Look. You shall return to the Lord your God and shall obey his voice according to all I commanded you this day, thou and thy children with all thy heart and soul. Then the Lord your God will turn thy captivity. This is what we're seeing when I say that second Exodus. He's turning away that captivity and have compassion on you and will return and gather thee from all nations whither the Lord your God has scattered you. And you saw the people coming back, but they still had the languages now of the people that had captured them, but they were coming and back, but this is not going to be the totality of where they need to be because that temple had already been defiled. You got Herodians running stuff. You got Rome picking your high priest. So we can't go into that right now. Verse four, it says, if any of thine be driven to the uttermost parts of the heaven, from thence will the Lord your God gather thee and will fetch thee there. And Yahweh, look, uh, don't skip him. And the Lord will bring you to the land that your fathers possessed and you shall possess it and he will do thee good and multiply you above your fathers. I'm gonna restore you. And the Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, your children to do what? To love your Lord, your God with all your heart. And the loving God is keeping his commandment, 1 John 5 and 3, I'm not gonna turn to it. With all thy soul that you may as live. And the Lord will put the curses on your enemies. Don't you want that? Don't you want that? Are you more righteous than God? He said that's what he's going to do and you don't want it. Okay? Where do you get your sense of morals that override his? He will put the curses on your enemies and on them that hate you and persecuted you. And you shall return and do what? Obey 
the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you this day. And people say, that's for them in the Old Testament. And I'm saying, you don't know what you're saying. Verse nine, and Yahweh thy God will make you plenteous in every work of your hand and the fruit of your body, the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your land. He will again rejoice over you to do you good. If you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. If you will turn unto the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, for this commandment which I command you this day is not hidden from thee, neither is far off. Listen to this. This is amazing. It's amazing. What does he say? Verse 12, it is not in heaven that you shall say, who shall go up for heaven and bring it to us that we may hear it. Look at what Paul is telling these people in Romans chapter 10, verse 5. For Moses describes the righteousness of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in your heart, who shall stand up in the heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. He's quoting Moses. You're saying that's Old Testament, but you use this ninth verse where it says, if you confess to them out the Lord Jesus and believe God is raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It was talking to Israel primarily. So let's look at it primarily in its context and see what Yahweh wants. And that second Exodus can also be the precursor and it can be the model for our Exodus from the mess that we're going through right here in our own hearts, our own souls, our own mind, our own government, our own legal ungodly system and the racism and the overlording that come from our person to tell us everything that we're supposed to know when they don't know themselves, when they went and... Ugh, we can talk about it in discussion. It says, who will bring it to us? Look, and who, should, who will go up to here that we may do it? It's not in heaven that you say who shall go up to heaven and bring it, it what the word, okay? Paul says here, say not who shall listen into heaven. It is to bring Christ, that it was the word. Bring it, the living word, down from us. Who shall ascend into the deep? I click on this word. You see the abusos? That's what's supposed to be under the water, the abusos. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Notice what he said. Neither is it beyond the sea, the abusos under the sea, that you should say, who should go over the sea for us? And it is that they may, that we may hear it and do it. Then he says, verse 14, but the word is very nigh thee and in your mouth and in your heart that you may as what? Do it. Notice what he says here. It says, verse 8, Paul is still quoting from there, but what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in your mouth. He's talking to Israelite people. He's talking to people of the covenant. He's talking to people that's under Roman dominion right now. I'm not saying it can't be used for somebody else, but let's let primary be primary first. That's what you say when I start talking about America. Let's talk about primary. Let's talk about primary. It says, it's now you even in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you shall believe, you shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord, that means ruler and sovereign. Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, that means Yahweh of salvation. Look at what he says. The word is now you in your mouth. That's what he's quoting from. See, I have said before you this day, life and good, death and evil, in that I command you this day to love God, that's to obey him, I promise you it is, watch me, to love the Lord your God and walk halak, that means to obey, walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, love who? The Lord your God, what here, Lord Jesus, Lord your God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his statutes and judgment that you may live and multiply and Yahweh your God will bless you in the land whether you go to possess it, but if your heart turn away so that you will not hear, but you shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve, serve them. I did announce to you this day, you shall surely perish and you shall not prolong your days in the land, whether you go with joy to possess it. Look at what he says here. But with the heart, okay, you believe God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. But with the heart, man believed to righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believed on him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between Jew and Greek for the Lord, the same Lord is rich unto all that come upon him. For whosoever should call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to see, I'm going to skip to this because I know really I need to go. I'm going to go to Romans 8, 13. That's, that should be my last verse, Romans 8 and 13. 
Paul says to these people, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. These people Moses denounced, if you shall, you will perish. If what? You don't do what he says. If you live after the flesh, don't do what he says. If he said, if you live after the flesh, you can't love God. If you live after the flesh, you should die. But if you through the spirit multiply the deeds of the, deeds of the body, you will live. All of that to get you to understand that these people were real people. It's not a Bible story. They were children under the province that had been kicked out of the land. They had lost their benefits. They had lost their privilege to leave. Nebuchadnezzar, he had took them out of the captivity. He had took them and made them captive. Nebuchadnezzar was in charge till he died. After that, the Medes and the Persians came. God turned the hearts of Nebuchadnezzar toward Daniel. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Not only that, then you'll see that I think Darius turned his heart toward Daniel. But then in the time of Cyrus, he turned his hearts toward his people. Then during the days of the different kings that came after that, they turned their hearts toward his people. But the people came out of that kind of bondage and many of them still had their mind bound to the culture and the system. If they hadn't had their mind bound to the culture and the system like they did, Alexander of Macedon wouldn't have been able to come and take over those people. They call him Alexander the Great. Nor would the Romans get to take over. And you wouldn't see the same beast like you do see the beast in the book of the Revelation. It's a, it, that same beast is the same one you see in Daniel. The point being made is this is why I say this is the second exodus. What? The children of Israel had to be taken into captivity because God going to keep his word. How? They came and got them out of the land. When in different deportations, where they took them right over there to Babylon, put them in that area. Why did he do it? Because if you don't know how to serve me, I'm going to make you serve somebody else. What does that have to do with us to say that we follow God and we say we love the New Testament? If you don't understand that Yahweh's pattern is, you do what I say, you're free. You're, you're, you're free, you're holy, you're righteous, you're peculiar people. But should you turn from me, I'm not bound to be locked to your wicked self. You always want me to be faithful and you're not going to be faithful to me? It's not going to work that way. We are created in Christ Jesus under good works. And those people, they had an exodus. They had the opportunity to be free from captivity. We're supposed to be made free from sin. We're supposed to become servants of God have our fruit into wholeness and the end everlasting life. We need an exodus. We need an exodus. We need an exodus from the things that are holding us back. If we can get an exodus from our sin and from our wrong thinking, don't think that Yahweh won't give us an exodus from the tyranny that we face on the books and from the apathy that is shown toward us as a people in this land. Merciful Savior, King Eternal, immortal, invisible. You dwell in the light that's unapproachable to men. No man can see you, nor have seen you. To you be glory and majesty, wisdom and power. Free our minds from anything that holds us and free our bodies when our minds are free to serve you as we should. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. I open this class for discussion. If there's any discussion to be had, or if there's somebody that don't like what I said, they can they can challenge it or ask me about it. Now we're open for discussion. Tim. Yes. You refer to first Exodus and second Exodus. In first Exodus, I mean, the second Exodus is because of the um, rejection and the disobedience to God's word. First Exodus from Abraham and so forth. Can you still hear me? I do. Would, what would you say? Other, I mean, I know God said you're going to be in land for 400 years. What would you say um, the reason for their being there? Um, I think it's the cause. Is it because just God said you're going to be there 
I've contemplated it. And I, I'll tell you part of what I've thought is that because Adam had everything and he didn't do it. So it's almost like, well, I need you, I need you to go through some hard times to see that you just, that you need me. That's just like, I guess in a nutshell, part of what I've thought. So I don't know if my question makes sense. If not, I'll try to, one seems to have the causation because you did it. The other one seems to be, God says, I'm sending you there. Was there the causation that came actually from them? Does that make sense for the first one? And that's that's one of the things when I, when I do a parallel, if I don't look at all of the parallels that are, that are given, it's easy to leave that on the table. So in this case, the Most High God had already said that this is what was going to happen with them. And we do know that they started serving other gods while they were there because mm -hmm. Joshua told them that they served the, uh, other gods on the other side of the flood. And so often whenever things happen that are what we call disadvantageous to us or things that we see as hardships, a lot of times the Lord does that because he's making us. He's taking us the hard way so that he, they, they, they can learn uh, who I am and what I am. And so with the captivity and the bondage that he gave them, he was able to show them their power, their might. They were able to learn how they orchestrated things, how they handled business because the whole time they were not in bondage, but they were in bondage for a long time, but they uh -huh. really entreated the people. And so that's when God gave them an exodus. I'm going to pull you from the strongest nation that's available. I'm going to pull you from the one that has the most religious. I mean, they had a lot of religious thing going on. They had religious power. They had the wealth. They were trading with the Kushites. Actually, they were trading from what I understand with everybody all over the world. Because when they say the people came from all over the world to get stuff from Joseph, we mm -hmm. think it was just the people in that area. But from what I'm reading, it was way more than what we thought. They've even found marijuana that doesn't even grow in Egypt in some of the Pharaoh's coffins. And we see that they have the same kind of um, machinery, or not machinery, the same kind of edifices in South America that the Egyptians have. And it's pretty much right. known that they've done it. I have a book by a man named uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima that talk about they were here before Columbus. Yeah, and, and some of those things are talked about. So I believe the major difference is, is one, I'm going to put it back like you were before I made you a nation and brought you out. I let you know who you were. I let you see how bad things were and that you needed me. Then I brought you to myself, adopted you in one sense, married you in another sense, became your God in another sense. And what you did was you turned against me after I had shown you all my might and all the things that I could do. In the case with these other people, you've already seen my history. You already know my resume and you still tried me. I got, I, I got to deal with you. I got to deal with you in such a way you never ever do that mess to me again. So um, he doesn't tell us a lot of other things like that they had did done so wickedly and this is wickedly, this is why they did it. But I do believe that's a part of it. But you don't find it in Genesis 15 when he tells Abraham of a certainty that your seed will be a stranger in the land and serve them for 400 years and they'll be evilly entreated and afterwards they'll come out with great substance. But if you read the passage, you don't realize that they're going to, that they, the Most High is going to spoil them. But you see that's what happened and they spoiled them. They, they routed them out and took everything they wanted. Mm -hmm. Did that help any? Yeah, that was good. That was good. Um, I like how you actually mentioned some of the cities and acts too, and showed actually what their core, what not correlate, correlation, what they are, where they came from. You know, you was mentioning. Um, different parts of Africa. And I, I mean, the one that stands out the most, I think is because it sounds very similar, Persia, and then different parts of Africa. And I, I, I think that was good. I particularly like your revisit to where we were on Saturday. I was trying to remember that, to, I think it was yesterday, because sometimes, you know, without going back and looking, if I've written notes, and I was trying to see how much I could remember. 
and I kept getting stuck. It was I was dreaming about it, and then when I woke up and I was remembering, I was trying to remember, and I couldn't get it, and I didn't want to look at anything. So when you went back to it tonight, I was like, okay, that's good, that's good. So um, to have that, to to understand first recipient, then application to the descendants of the first recipient. So we won't um, take that and do this misapplication that we can quote part of the scripture without having any context and say we can do what we want to do. So that that is, I, I, I appreciated that. That was good. Thank you very much. Anyone else or anything else? Please tell the Tim. I don't know who it was. It was somebody just on that. That was Bro Charles, I believe. That sounded like Bro Charles. Well, I sure didn't hear him saying much. I mean, I want him to go ahead and speak up, and not hold I him. might be wrong, but that's who I think it was. Hey. Okay, let's say Bro Charles. Talk to you. No. Quick question, though. That guy that said he was saved. Ross always say, "Yes." What do he say when he sing? What do what do he do? Uh, how do he? I mean, yeah, what is his thoughts on that when he when he sing? Because you back then, you know, they offered the animal or the sacrifice. So did he have a, a, a solution for that? Yes, sir. His solution his solution for that is this: is that once you're saved, you're always saved, and God deals with your body by giving your body a constant but your spirit only thing you fade it out a little bit tim god deals with what can you hear me now yes it said god deals with your spirit but the consequences is only to your flesh and he said yes all your sins are forgiven past present and future he said that's what jesus died for so that that would you would not have to deal with that anymore and so can you still hear me, Gary? Yeah. So, you know, I'm asking because of what happened Saturday. So I asked him, I said, so why do you have a problem then with the policeman killing people, putting their knee on somebody's neck? Why do you have a problem with the slave owners when they hung out people on the tree, rape men, and call it breaking the buck, going in, taking our wives, raping them? I said, why do you have a problem with that? If what you're saying is true, then all they did was live out what you're saying, that once they were saved, that their spirit was saved and they'll just have a consequence for what they did. And he kept interrupting me and the other guy because I was going to say some of those men died, you never saw their consequence that they got. And so then I ask him, what does 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 mean when it says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of himself with mankind, these covetous, revilers, uh, extortionists shall have any, you know, that they, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then I told him Galatians 5 and 19 have a list. I gave him Revelation 21 and 8. Because he started talking about, you mean to tell me if a man murdered somebody and he gets saved, he's going to hell? Well, first of all, the man should have been put to death and not even got to hang around and live if we followed God's righteous laws. When you take a life, your life supposed to be taken because the man is in the image of God, not because he's somebody to be saved. No. So if, if, if because our laws are so lax that that man does get to repent, and the Lord accepted, he still need to be put to death. And you don't like me saying it, so what? God said, do it. He didn't, Jesus didn't call the thief down from the cross and say, you know what? Man, you, you're gonna turn your heart to me right now. You just chastise that other guy. You just asked me today, can you be with me in paradise? I'm gonna let you get off the cross and I'm gonna put a, a force field around you like that girl on the Fantastic Four and nobody can hurt you since you say that you don't have to die. No, he let him die. But he said today you'll be with me in paradise. Now here's your question. If the Lord came in and told you right now, Gary, you can continue to live or you can go be with me today where I am. What you gonna choose? I guess he don't know, Bertrand. 
<laughs> what would you do, bro? Tell us the Lord so you can go be with him right now. He come and take you by and Come and go. You can be with me now. Or Paradise, Tim. But the thing is, what about your children? <laughs> you know, like, I'm straight, I'm, I might be straight betwixt the two. <laughs> I, I know that Ann told me one time she felt like she was dying and she was happy. She said it felt uh -huh. so good leaving her body. She said it felt... I said, what about us? She said, it felt good. Bye, Tim. Bye, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> hush, Gary, hush. <laughs> I love you, Tim. <laughs> well, Charles, he laughing at me, telling us. <laughs> but did, okay, Brett Charles, did I at least achieve part of my goal to make the book of Ezra seem like it's got some stuff in it worth worth listening to and 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 looking in? I mean, looking forward to. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. That's your stuff. Yeah, yeah. So this is what I missed last week because I couldn't hear a word. <laughs> well, I didn't teach it exactly the same last week. This week, uh -huh. I. I went more into, last week I talked to you that they were, but this week I just talked more about why. And, and God knows, I I gave what it would call the cliff notes or the cliff notes, but I think it's enough to, even if I expanded upon it, you would still have the, you would still have the framework. And the framework is that these people should still be able to be identified. You should be able to look and see where these people came from. If you can look and see who people were, say, in the 300s, 500s, 700 ADs, if you can see who, who, who was who, and if you can see that people that are now called Talmudists around 500 B, I mean, AD were not considered to be the Jews. If you can see that when Titus and Vespasian, well, Alexander actually came through and killed a lot. Then Antiochus Epiphanes came through and he scattered people, killed people. The, many of them were sent away by the Assyrians. And I mean, look, you will see black Chinese people. We've been scattered, okay? If you look at India, you look at Pakistanis and you'll see a lot of them black as we are. You also see some that don't look as black. You'll see the area that a lot of times that are being overrun now by people that don't look like us if you go back far enough in history to look at their artifacts, you'll see the darkness, the super, super darkness of the people that were Nubians and uh, the Kushites, they, ran, they owned a lot, man. They, they owned a lot. Nimrod was a big king and he owned all the way into Arabia as well as in Africa. And you be, all of a sudden you start getting a Gutenberg press and then you start being able to print stuff and then have a monopoly on how much stuff can be printed at ease, you can make the black man be the, the dredge of society. Whereas when you look at that area of the world where the Messiah came from, you don't find us being the dregs of the world. You actually find great civilizations. You see much gold, much silver, much artifice, much writing. I mean, look at the writing that we're reading. It wasn't written in European. Even they'll tell you that it, the scriptures are written in Hebrew, which is the Afro-Hemitic or Afro-Semitic language or semito hamic They got different ways, but it's actually talking about those people, what they call Oriental as opposed to Occidental, and they'll, they just depend on how close you are to Asia. But those people were either Hamites many times, they were Semites, sometimes they call Hebrew, but they call it the Asiatic language. It was not what is called an Indo-Euro language. The land, the land was not the land that was inhabited by the Norsemen, by the Germans, by the Swedish, by the Poland. No, when they start coming to those lands, when the children of Israel did what they did, that shouldn't have been done. Alexander comes down there and he conquers, uh, he conquers that area over there because they didn't think nobody could get to them in Petra. 
But the Lord already said they scraped the ground with those people. And then when Persia, I mean, when Rome took over them, they kept their culture in their language, but they built roads. So when you have problems, they could go and squash it. It was called Pax Romana. And, but then again, it, when you go to history, we, we're nothing. You can go look in sometimes you can see hundreds and hundreds of inventions that we made and we didn't even make any of them. <laughs> But the Most High God, they'll tell you in the heartbeat, he don't care nothing about that. Well, how did you get to speak for him? Since when he didn't care about truth anymore? Since when? He even told you who the father of lies were. So what's wrong with me knowing who the real father of the telephone is? But anyway, that's another issue. And then they'll have the nerve to say this has nothing to do with salvation. Uh, it does for a lot of people. When people know their history or when they know the history of America and they don't want to hear anything about your Jesus, they don't want to hear anything about your Christ, they don't want to hear anything about your once saved, always saved because they know what you did to that great, great granddaddy or if they wanted the descendants of Jefferson that he treated with different kind of medicines and drugs before he treated his white family. They, they, what they did, they took the name that went with Christ and you you took it in vain and you bastardized it. And then you have our people thinking that it's a white man's religion and it's not. It's just the fact they had a problem if it would have been a black man's religion. What if what if for the last 300 years, let's say the last, let's take from about 300 AD of Constantine that they call the great. If a black man had been over the Catholic church and the black people had changed days whatever and everywhere you go everybody's black and you taught it i guarantee you just like when you go to church you separate the church they probably wouldn't even mention jesus <laughs> probably wouldn't even mention him mm -mm. why is that somebody has been taught and it was bred into the american colonies that we got a problem because some of these white people that are poor that are indentured servants and some of these black people that you bring over here and slay, they're making the indentured service of say, because they can't make money because you got these people here, they working all the time and they don't get to get any money. So you got them working, so we don't like them. So you got a problem at the Bacon's Rebellion that you know whites and blacks got together. So what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about that? How can we impress them more? How can we do more to them that we've already done? What we'll do, we'll start letting the poor white be the police for us. And when you find one run away, when you find one on certain parts of town without a certain letter, you take him back, we'll give you $25. Okay. And whenever whenever something happened, if you, you know, if you bring the scalp, there's a certain amount you can get. And then when you can, they're on the wrong side of the road, they do such, such, such a thing, you tell you can get paid. So all of a sudden you make everything black seem wrong. And then if white people are with a black man, you teach them how to read, you find them a hundred dollars way back then. You, you breed into the pores of the trash that was white, that they are better than the black. And so now when you come to your religion, how are you gonna let a savage teach you the wonderful eloquent word of God? We got a lot of work to unravel. If, if the olive tree is gonna grow up like it should, if it's not gonna grow up like it should, I just wanna deal with the truth. I don't wanna to lie to make people like me. That's duplicity. I wanna be able to tell the truth and if you still like me when I can tell the truth, great. I've been disliked a lot, a long time by church people. But they, most of the time, they never sit down with me and let's go scripture for scripture, history for history, word for word, culture for culture. I just get dismissed because some reason they have some kind of automatic power over me. And, I, and the thing is, is I refuse to capitulate. Uh, I already, like I say, I've already lived longer than I believe I'll live in this body. I don't think I'm going to duplicate my age. If I do, if you let my mind be strong, maybe by then I won't need to open my Bible when I read. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Is everybody getting tired? Tell Tim.
And you know that confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Do we realize that how much of that was written to the descendants of Abraham? I'm not saying that it has no application, but that's a secondary to the Jew first and also the Greek. For herein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Is everybody through a discussion or is there any more discussion? Uh, I was gonna say that was good, man. I always wonder about how the people that women people say that they will come over here on ships and be scattered abroad. They business won't prosper. Uh, they'll be hated by all kindred, all kinds of people. And I used to tell people, that's us. <laughs> and they was like, that ain't us. So, so I, I just never figured it out. I didn't never know any other people to come over on ships. I'm, I'm actually opening back up to Deuteronomy 28. That what you're talking about? And mm -hmm. in 68, I remember the first time somebody told me that and I didn't believe him. Like, man, you can't tell me that. I know where the Israelis live. I watch the news. Uh, Deuteronomy. <laughs> <laughs> it says in Deuteronomy 28, 60, man, it's just so sad. Look at 64. It said, the Lord will scatter you among all people from one end of the earth to another. Now, are you going to tell me that's people that are Ashkenazi Talmudists? It says, there you shall serve other gods, which thou know thy fathers have known, even of wood and of stone. And among these nations you'll find no ease, neither shall the sole of your foot have rest. But the Lord shall give you a trembling heart and failings of eyes and sorrow of mind, and your life shall hang in doubt before thee, and you shall fear day and night and shall have no assurance of their life. Read Ezekiel Archie's letter in the mind that was owned by J.T. Milner, the one who sold it to United Steel and was a senator in the United States of America. 67, in the morning you will say, would to God it were even. In the evening, would to God it was morning. For the fear of thine heart wherein you shall fear, for the sight of thine eyes, which you shall see, 68. And the Lord and Yahweh shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships by the way of whereof I spake unto you. Thou shall see it no more again. And thou shalt be sold unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy or redeem you. Now, my real magnificent question is, Show me where the French were taken apart in ships and had to serve like that. And no man would buy them where they had to work day and night, day and night. I'm not talking about something that the French did with the French. I'm talking about all over the earth. Show me what happened to the Australians. Please show me. Please. Show me what happened to the Russians. Please don't tell me what Russian did to Russian. We're talking about all nations of the earth. Show me what that happened to the, the Pakistanis. Show it to me where it happened to the people of the Caucasus Mountains by the Black Sea. Please show it to me where it happened in all of those places where those other people are that will claim to be Jews or British Israelites, where they've been taken all over the earth in ships, forced to speak another tongue. Show me where that happened to the Germans. Actually, when the Germans came over here, they were given positions to make bombs and to make all kind of war stuff for the World War. Don't tell me it's the Europeans because they actually control. They the ones sent people over here, Britain, and colonize. We call it globalism now. Show me any other people where laws have been made to lock them up just for being outside at night where everybody else could be outside. Show me any other place where somebody could just walk up to you and tell, say you owe them money, but it's against the law to say you don't because now you've talked against a white man and now you can be sentenced to four months in prison that lasts you four or five years or until you die. Show me where corporations like United Steel 
and other such companies can kill so many black people and they still be considered to be a great company. Show me, show me where all the world can go crazy over one, one set of Germans that are killed by another set of Germans that you said was 6 million. What about the 19 million black babies killed in the womb? What about the estimates from five to 18 million black people killed in the transatlantic Indian slave trade and nothing being said? And you mean to tell me that none of this has to do with us and yet the New Testament is full of speaking about the Hebrew people, Paul. So I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrew. I'm a I'm an Israelite. I'm born of Benjamin. As a matter of fact, just like the guy that was talking to me today that didn't understand talking about nobody can keep God's law. He kept cutting me off. And I and I forgot to tell him Elizabeth was blameless. Zacharias was blameless. Paul said, according to the law, he was blameless. The Bible said John the Baptist was a righteous and a just man. So what ends up happening is if we don't begin to look and see our Bible is historically accurate, it may take a little work because a lot of things have been covered on the leaves. But if we look, we'll see that we got a heritage that was taken from us and we've lived like it. Nobody came to get us. When I see my Mexican friends, they got abogados, they have different kind of, they like they have an embassy, they have people that can come by and do things for them. Who came, where can we go when, when America does us wrong? If you're Indian, you can appeal to India. If you're Pakistani, you can appeal to Pakistan. Russia, you can appeal to Russia. If you're, if you're from Japan, you can appeal to Japan. But look, who can we appeal to? We like, we have no home. We had to appeal to many times justices that hated us. Well, Dred Scott, just like Dred Scott, he appealed to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Tenney said, there's no, there's no rights that a black man has, that a white man has an honor. I mean, Maryland in 1638, they wrote there that black people are not even allowed any of the fruits of white man's enjoyment in America. This is, this is, this is the stuff that Christianity embraced because of greed and because of covetousness and identity theft. And now we, we have the opportunity to turn back to Yahweh and we want to turn everything else. I ain't playing with you. I turn if nobody he else. Say he go to. Say what? He didn't say what church he went to, did he? Who? Oh, no, this guy. The guy that he talked No, yeah. but he might as well went to Charles Stanley's church or, or went to Bob mm -hmm. Joyce's church or went to the church of somebody living in the universe. He went to what is an evangelical Western Christianized church that teaches that once saved, always saved, and that God can't do nothing to you once you've made that sinner's prayer, which, in, which primarily was not being told to everybody for everybody it was actually being told to the hebrew people to remember what moses said if you turn if you do this what god would do but again uh when people split the bible in half like that they can do those kind of reindeer games I, i'm like i, I don't want to play i don't need a red nose I didn't tell the truth, Mama. But Charles? Yeah. Have you been disturbed a little bit tonight? Yeah. Have you noticed yet in your slaves' Bible they have not, the book of Psalms is not in there at all? It's not. Now I tell my brother about it last night. He said he's going to get him one. Okay. <laughs> he said he's gonna get it. I was telling him about I was reading and then going through some of it. And uh, you know, of course I got the uh the other book as well. So I'm kinda trying to juggle between them two. And then he mentioned another book to get uh called a, I thought he told me to ride the white pale the white the white pale the, horse. The, the pale like the pale horse? Yeah, something like that. I think he told me I should get it as well, dealing with Dealing with uh, they call it end time. 
Yeah, I think again. We, we had that book on MP3. Uh, it, it had stuff dealing with end times as well. I didn't. Uh, I gotta get these read first <laughs> before I can tackle well, another one. Well, actually, if you actually if you read the Bible, we've already read the slaves' Bible. The thing is, yeah, what, I just want to... the thing that you want to look at is look in your table of contents. On the first page, at the bottom of that page, it will show you that the books that are missing. There are books that are missing. I and and then you look in the and then you look at some of them to show you how many chapters are there. So what was done is by taking away that much, there was a certain amount that the slaves wouldn't have, and the slaves wouldn't even be able to pray for God to damn and to kill uh, the people that were abusing them because you had taken away that element. And that's why to this day people don't think that we ought to pray and ask God to execute his judgment on the wicked, the ungodly, the rapists, and all of that. They think, oh, we just supposed to forgive. And you, and they tell you nothing about uh, bringing forth fruit meat for repentance. So we end up not having the truth. And that's and the reason we don't have the truth because often preachers don't want to preach it. Maybe they want to be accepted in a certain place. I don't know. But I want to be accepted by the Most High God. I think some of them just don't know. What happened when I try to tell them? You've been with me before and I try to tell somebody. How do they act? Like, thank you. Yeah, yeah, man, I know. <laughs> you don't take all that. <laughs> and, and it's like, how did you, how did they determine it didn't take all of that? Like, I can almost, a lot of time I can tell you hadn't even read the whole text yourself. You got all that mouth, strong mouth. And the sad thing about it is you didn't have to have that much. <laughs> My mom said, tell him just share it with me. But it's a sad, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing to find that the people that you want to help they're the very ones that don't want it. Isn't that what happened to the Messiah? Mm -hmm. He came to his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So a lot of them didn't receive him. Now your brother and there is, you can get the, um, the slave Bible. I don't like it as much as I like the unholy Bible because the Unholy Bible does the work for you. But I was, it, can you see my screen? Uh, I zoomed out. Okay. Out my phone. Let, let me stop yeah. it. I'm going to do a new share of my screen. Uh, I'm going to share the screen. Where is the beautiful share? <laughs> there it is. I got to click on this first. Then I'm going to share it. There's on Kindle, you can get what is called the Slave Bible, okay? I got it open here, go to the front club cover. And this one is select parts of the Holy Bible for use of the Negro slave. Let me see somebody's coming in. Let me see. What that means zooming back in. I know, try, I'm try, there you are. Okay. And it's called the Unholy Bible the front cover is by hardpress.net. It says select parts of the Holy Bible for use of the Negro slaves in the British West India Islands. And it says it's by unknown, but Law and Gilbert did it. And as I scroll through, they just copied it like that. And see, it, it doesn't go and give you the other information. But you tell your brother or anybody that you're talking about this book that they can go and look on YouTube and the man has about an hour video called the Unholy Bible. And he goes through all the work he had to do to get it copied. Once once he does that, that's why I like it better than this one. You can read this one all day long, but at a glance, it'll show you this book missing, this book missing, this book missing. I think they have eight chapters of Deuteronomy in it. You have just a few chapters of Exodus, two chapters of Exodus, whole books missing, New and Old Testament. 
Hey, but that's the way most people have their slave Bible right now in their church. And there are probably some people right now that you know, that you know well, that never read the book of Ezra, never read the book of Nehemiah. So what's the difference? What's the difference in having a slave Bible and you choose yourself not to read it? I don't see a big difference. One of them forced and the other one is just apathy. I, I just don't care nothing about God's word. I'll just suppress that truth in my mind and I don't need all of that. And you the people that say that, they probably the one that need the most. Because in the words of Andrina, they think they're good. Andrina, I don't I hadn't heard you but once tonight. Can you at least just say hello to me if nothing else? Hello, Tim. Hi. <laughs> hello, Tim. Yes, my girl. What's happening? Did I bore you to tears tonight? No, sir. Okay. I sent you a picture of some of some Semitic people. You did? On well, your on your cell phone. I don't know if you can see it. It's on my cell. Let me see. Oh my cell. Okay, I'm gonna I'm getting ready to forward it to my my Yahoo so I can I can share it on the screen. So Brother Charles, uh, Charles, I believe in my soul he wanna see it so hard. I believe he wants <laughs> Brother Charles, am I am I accusing you correctly? Yeah, I want to see it. Okay. I'm doing it's, Man, she had already sent it to my kindred. They look like they came out of one of our books. It did. Okay. I yeah, see another one where, where it's so, uh, showing you about the, where you were talking about the wild beast and the, and the birds. Mm -hmm. It's showing you. It's a little, uh, the men are naked, so let me warn you of that. <laughs> you know, when you go to the gym, a lot of time as a man, you see more naked men than you want to. It just, I mean, one time I quit a gym for that. It's like, why y'all, why, why y'all got the dog, you know? It's no. like, it, it's like, what's the deal if it's what i think that i am I'm, it is i'm not interested but uh i've already sent three to my email is i'm having to do them one at a time but y'all give me give me another second i'm i'm not as fast as the teenagers they have a little more speed than i do all right so. jim did you did you want to kill the bird that flew over your head yes <laughs> I did. As a matter of, as a matter of fact, one time it happened to me when I first moved to Atlanta, and the, it, it had done it in my head and all over my sweater. I had maybe like a Bill Cosby like sweater on, and I was there with the lady. I said, "I wish I had a gun. I could shoot it." And this lady reached in her pocket, <laughs> and she pulled out this pistol, looked like it would knock a man off. Of it, out of, off of his motorcycle, it was so strong. And I, I picked it up and, and he said, you can't shoot in Atlanta, you can't, you know, I'm coming from Gainesville. We could shoot back then, this was a long time ago. So they're like, you can't shoot in Atlanta. That, that's, I, I forget, that was a big fine. But I don't think I'd have hit it anyway, cause I mean, a bullet and a bird fly, a shotgun, yeah. But I, put, I could put it right at his nose and then he's gonna fly into it and see his feathers popping all over the ground. All right, so now let me open this up so Brother Charles can see what she sent me. And, oh, you got to open it up first on this one. I got one more thing to do, Brother Charles. Let's see, here, that's one. Open.
You know, when I get to where I can do this fast, I help him want to be Gary. You know, like how, how Josiah can just go in and type it in. Yep. All right, now we're there. Now let's open up my little email of Kindred. Folk don't know what Kindred is. They don't have to know. All right. Now it's open. Thank the Lord. Now let's go back and share with Brother Charles. Because he wants to be a nice man. Mm -hmm. And share. Where it, there, share screen. There's that. Now share. Whew. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And open. I said open. I don't see it. Well, I just sent it to me. Calm down, be patient. My mama told me to calm down and be patient, Brother Charles. But I know I <laughs> Let me just try my scent. Full photos, documents, scent. All right. There we go. I, I found a way to skin that cat. Okay. I want this full screen. And plus. Okay, you see you see the wild beast? Look at that hair. Can you see that hair? Can you see that? Can you see those afros? Uh -huh. And that a quote from Jeremiah. I will appoint over them for kind of destroyer, saith Yahweh, the sword to slay, and the birds of the air, and the beasts of the earth to devour. Okay? Look at them. Let me. Are the artifacts right here, are there anything about the artifacts that make you think that these people are Caucasoid? I know not. Okay? Then that's another picture of it. Let me go back out. Open the second one that I sent to myself. See, see the lion? Get ready to get him. Look at his nose. Look at his nose. He's black, mama. He's a black man. And the birds, the buzzards right there. We had to pick him in the head. See it, bro, Charles? See that buzzard? About to bust him in the head, got his feet on the other one. Okay. It is a little graphic, but I, I hope you missed that part. When she said they were naked, I didn't know they were going to be all the way live. <laughs> I did. Woo. Okay. Let me open this one. That's That's the description of the other one. Okay. The presentation, the presentation tribute by submit by Semitic invoice period shown in this Egyptian wall painting from the tomb of Sibek Lotep at Thebes and dating from around 1420 BCE. The relationship between the Jews and the Egyptian during this period is extremely complex. Whether the Hebrews were expelled from Hebrews or left of their own accord is a matter of conjecture. Certainly no archaeological evidence has been found as yet to support the biblical version of the Exodus. Oh, you can't find the sea still open. Oh, how sad. Oh, just intelligent people. Sometimes people have too much to say, but they've seen they've seen Cro-Magnum man, okay? They've seen they've seen the fossils change. Again, look at this picture here. Semitic. From Abraham to the second temple. These are a set of books that I own that go through and just show. And this was written done by them. This was done by the Talmudists. Before we start paying attention, they were showing it just like it is. 
Remember I talked about the Hiskos that was there? And it says, the settlement of the Hebrew people in Egypt may have begun in 1800 BCE. Some historians believe that they fled before the advance of the Hiskos, H-Y-K-S-O-S, Asiatic people who conquered Egypt in about 1650 and dominated upper and lower Egypt, Palestine for the next 200 years. It says, lower Egypt for 200 years. However, the Hiskos appears to have contained some Semitic elements and these, well as the Hebrews, were by now gaining a definite identity. And the people called the Hebrew or the Heperu or Heperu mentioned in cuneiform tablets. Uh, they seem to be the name as, they're like PWR, as found in Ethiopian hieroglyphics. Historians are divided. Yeah, you, if, if it's black, it's divided. Just always know that. The black people are supposed to always be nothing. But the Most High God, he, he got a day coming when he gonna let the world know, you've done what you've done to my people the last time. All we need to do is call his name and turn back to him and let him fight our enemies and we are gonna win. Do you hear me, Brother Charles? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrina. I really want you one day, if you will, there ought to be some kind of scanner that will scan uh, to the computer and, and I can have that. Uh, some kind, I saw something one time on, on uh, Facebook, but sometimes they be selling stuff, I don't believe in them, but some kind of scanner that will scan stuff because some of the books that I have, they're not on Kindle. And there are some things that I want people to be able sometime to see just like you did that. So if you know Brother Charles or if somebody does know if they happen to watch this video in the future, uh, make me a note of, of a good scanner, not one that you try to put the book in and then the book be folded. Maybe it'll sit on top like that. I've seen one that, I, that can scan it, but I have never seen it in person. So I'm ignorant and I don't want to be ignorant. I want to know what can do that for me. It was easier for me to just take a picture of it. You did, and I appreciate it. To scan it. Anything else? Anybody else? And I appreciate your help, Andrina. I'm about to close out the class, you all. Don't be scared. May the Most High bless us, keep us, empower us, make us righteous ambassadors to do his will in this wicked and ungodly earth to the praise of his glory. Help us to regain and to gain our status in you and in your son. Help us, Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. Good night, everyone. Good night.